Okay. Um, I think we'll begin because we're pretty close and there's people in the room, so let's get going. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us and the Darien Library this afternoon for a great program with S.J. Bennett and her book, The Winds Are Not. Before I introduce S.J., Sophia, I'd like to thank our partners at Barrett Bookstore, where you'll find copies of this intriguing read for, and for the friends of the library who keep these programs going. Please type any questions you have into the Q&A field and we will address them at the end of the program. Now, let, give, let me give you a little background on SJ. And I can tell you that she gained her PhD in Italian literature from the University of Cambridge and was a strategy consultant at McKinsey and Company before becoming a professional writer. She has published 10 books for teenagers winning the Times Chicken House Competition for Threads in 2009, and then the Romantic Novel of the Year Award for, of the Year of the Award for Love Song in 2017. This is her first mystery where the queen holds a starring role. SJ is joining us today from her home in London. We also have a raffle of tea goodies for everyone that is online and attending this program today. So we'll have a winner after the program's over. So how are you? How's London? Um, it's it's a, a balmy spring evening in London. Um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been it's been a cold and windy spring and colder than usual. Um, but it's just starting to get nice. So hooray. Good, good. Well, would you tell us a little bit about the book without giving the whole thing away, just to familiarize our audience? I am very happy to. Um in this book, um, the investigator is the queen, the real queen, the one that we know, um, uh, the one that we've seen quite a lot of recently. And uh, I got the idea for it when I was watching an old episode of The Crown and the queen did something in it that I just didn't think she would do. And she looked like she didn't quite know what she was talking about. Um, and I thought, wow, what an expert she is in, in so many fields, actually. Thinking about her as an expert got me thinking about her as a detective. So um, it's set in 2016. So it's coming up for her 90th birthday. And the book is set at Windsor Castle because that is her favorite of her four places that she calls home. Um, and it's where she spends most weekends, um, even if she's um, kind of at Buckingham Palace most of the time, and where she spends the spring, including when she has her birthday in April. So it's set in, in 2016, and there's a suspicious death after one of her dinner parties, a dine and sleep at Windsor Castle. Um, and the Queen does what the Queen is supposed to do, which is sit back and let the police and uh, the security services deal with it. Um, but they make an increasing hash of it, she thinks. And the more certain they get that they're on the right track, the more certain she is that they're not on the right track and she knows better than them. Um, and so she has to investigate herself. And she has a sidekick for this, who is her assistant private secretary. And I think we're gonna be talking a bit about her. Um, and so the assistant private secretary is fictional, but it is based on something that I interviewed for myself back in the nineties and um, her name is Rosie Ashodi. And sometimes you, you see it from Rosie Ashodi's point of view and Rosie is quite new to the job and she doesn't quite know what's going on to start with, but the queen keeps asking her to do these very strange things and not tell anyone about it. And Rosie gradually comes to understand that she is helping the queen solve a crime and that the queen has done this before and she's used previous women assistant private secretaries. And there's a kind of club of them, a secret club of these women who've, who've helped the queen do this, who are the only people really who knows that's what she does. And, and off they go, um, secretly trying to work out who killed this person and how they died. Perfect, that's a wonderful synopsis. Um, why did you pick the queen's 90th? Um, it was originally out of laziness. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thought, well, I want to set it in the recent past so I don't have to do too much historical research. Um, and I just write about, you know, a period of time I know really well. And originally I set it in the kind of vague recent past. I thought I'll set it at a time when there wasn't too much going on in the Queen's life and um, unlike now. And 
yeah, a kind of gentle period of time for her. Um, anyway, I, I gradually I found out, I think as, as we'll discuss, that you can find out officially what she has done kind of pretty much every day of her reign. Um, and, and it just became interesting to me to, to set it in a very particular time. And 2016, it was kind of a couple of years before the, the time when I was writing. Um, and it was lovely setting it around her 90th birthday. It was a really happy time for her. Everything was going okay. Everyone seemed fairly settled. Um, it was a lovely birthday. Um, the, the country was really happy for her. Um, so it was, a, it was a nice backdrop for, for what I was writing. But then I discovered, having done it out of laziness, I then became obsessive in my research about exactly what she was doing uh, in 2016. So I could actually have set it any time and I would have done the same amount of research. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, I don't think we have dine and sleeps at the White House. So could you tell our audience what those are? I don't think you do, do you? Um, so. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we should recommend them to the Bidens. They're <laughs> such a fun thing. Um, I discovered these. My my youngest son, who's now 14 and towers over me, I mean, he was, he was a little boy, he was six or seven, and he missed a school trip to go to Windsor Castle, which is about a 45 minute drive from where we live. Um, and so I took him another day and we went around the castle and we were just getting to the end of our, our visit and we were both drooping a bit and somebody said, oh, we we're in, in what I now know is the state dining room, which is not particularly large, but it can seat 20 people. And um, it, the table was set for a really glamorous dinner party and somebody said, what's, what's this all about? And they described dine and sleeps. And I thought, right, I want to go to one of these. So at this time of Easter, around her birthday, the Queen, outside of a pandemic, um, invites uh, about 20 people to dinner and she tries to be very clever about the, who she gets to come and how she mixes and matches people and and she's curious about people and she gets celebrities so she's i mean i love the fact helen mirren who played the queen in the queen the film has been a guest there um and tim peak who is our astronaut um really just got the one at the moment um and delia smith who's one of our famous celebrity chefs has been and helena bonham carter has been and and, and ambassadors go and all sorts of things. So the 20 people come for dinner and then there's an entertainment afterwards and they go to the library at Windsor Castle and the Queen has things laid out for them that they might be interested in seeing. And then they stay overnight. Um, this is the lovely part. So they, they come with their overnight bags which get unpacked for them by servants and they stay overnight and then they all have breakfast and then they go home the next day. And it just sounds such fun. So. I can't go myself, haven't been invited, so I put it in a book. It's wonderful. Maybe you will get an invite. Well, maybe, uh, maybe not after these books. <laughs> well, I've heard you sent a copy to the Queen. I, I did. Well, yeah, I did. W with a letter absolutely addressed to her saying, I hope you don't mind me doing this, uh, done with a lot of affection. Um, but I addressed it to one of her assistant private secretaries, because in fact, she's nowadays got two and they're both men at the moment and uh so I, I sent it to one because i thought he might find it quite funny to find himself um kind of transformed into a a very tall kick-ass <laughs> black woman for this role um and uh i got a very polite note back from him saying thank you very much for sending it oh, no. But obviously, you know, the Queen famously doesn't comment on stuff. So I did not say, you know, she's read it and loved it. Mm. But um, we do know various people who know her. Um, and, and I know people quite close to her have been sent the book and some of them have really enjoyed it. So I think it's unlikely that she hasn't seen it. I think it's really unlikely she hasn't seen it. I can just imagine being given it as a kind of comedy Christmas present. Um, so um, whether she chose to read it or not, I don't know, but she could. Oh, I, I can't imagine she didn't. Um, tell the audience a little bit about how you created the character of Rosie, who is the undersecretary? Assistant Sorry. private secretary. Thank you. Um, I have a thing in book two where I talk about the fact that there's the private secretary and the assistant private secretary, neither of whom are secretaries, but they do have two <laughs> assistants who are. Um, so the private secretary is the person who's in charge of the queen's relationship with the government and kind of her official duties. And so all the official stuff kind of goes through him and he's a really important guy. Um, and, and then he has this, this staff who kind of help him, but they do report directly to the queen and they call her the boss. Um, and, and so Rosie is, is doing the, the job that I, I interviewed for. 
but when I interviewed for it, I was in my late twenties, I think, and I was told I was too young. I might even be in my early thirties, probably late twenties. Um, so I was told I was too young, and um, but Rosie is thirty, and since those days, they have got a little bit younger. Um, she's thirty. She has just come from a city bank, so I mean, as you said, Kathleen, I, I was at McKinsey, and that's kind of how people picked up on me to because I was asked to interview for the role. So she's been at a city bank, but before that, she was in the British Army for a few years. She's fought in Afghanistan. Um, she she's very good at riding, um, but she grew up on on quite a, um, a kind of rough uh, estate um, in London. And um, she's kind of just done everything herself. You know, she, she got herself into university. She, she worked day and night to, um, to pay for riding lessons. Um, and, and she's kind of a tough cookie. And I absolutely love writing about her because she doesn't know everything. She has to ask questions. She has to kind of work things out for herself, but um, she always gets herself out of trouble. And um, there's quite a lot of wish fulfillment. But um, as I was saying, she, she is black. She's um, of Nigerian heritage. And it was really important to me to have a woman of color in this book because I really wanted it to be a contemporary story. And you're writing about the queen, you know, it can often not feel that way. Um, but I live in London, I teach in London, I teach writing. And a third of my students usually are men and women of color. And that, you know, that's just how London is. And so I really wanted to represent that. Um, and one of my students um, comes from a big um, Nigerian family and I thought it'd be really fun to, um, to capture that kind of the exuberance that they have when they're together and that, that contrast with the non-exuberance that you have mm -hmm. when you're mm -hmm. working with the Queen. Um, so Rosie's grandparents came over to, to the UK and I, I worked a lot with, with with people um, who've had that kind of um, upbringing. And so Rosie's grandfather, the only job that he could get in London was washing bodies um, in oh. the morgue. And, and then her, her parents were sort of the next generation and her mother was, was a, a nurse and her father worked uh, on the London Underground. And they, they, there's Rosie, third generation kind of working. Yeah, probably. very good. Um, it sounds like there's a series afoot. And there if there is, do you plan to um, pick themes or buildings or events or how do you go about creating a series? That's a really good question. Um, when I had the, the idea that the Queen is a detective, instantly Windsor Castle came to me as the first setting I really wanted to create because it is, I mean, you know, she's called Elizabeth Windsor, so absolutely. Um, but as I was thinking about that story, I was thinking, yeah, but I've kind of got to set one at Buckingham Palace and I'd love to do one at Balmoral up in Scotland. Mm. And actually what I'm doing at the moment is Sandringham in Norfolk by the sea. And then I was thinking there's a Royal Train, that would be fun. And, and the Royal Yacht Britannia, which really, really fascinates me. <laughs> um, and my mother met the Queen on board Britannia in 1986 in Hong Kong. And then I was thinking, of course, you know, the Queen used to travel a lot. So there's Canada, there's America. Um, I'd love the idea of her visiting racehorse owners in Kentucky or something like that, or in Virginia, right. and, uh, and solving crimes there. Um, and I realized, you know, it's going to take many, many stories to, to use up this incredible life that she's had. So um, I'm contracted to write five books in the UK, three so far in the US, um, and, and then take it from there. But I'd love to do 20. I think it'll take 20 at least to, to do everything oh. I want to do. She's a wealth of um, inspiration. Um, yeah. Now you touched briefly on the fact that your mother was on the Britannia and I've heard that you have some family history with the queen. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, when I interviewed for this job, I, I, I was in Buckingham Palace um, in the office that I give to Rosie, but I didn't meet the queen myself. That would have been the next interview. But um, my father was in the army for 30 years and he was with the Gurkhas and the Queen is very fond of them as a regiment. And uh, he met her many times. Um, I think the first time was when he was given a, a medal, but the second time was when I first got interested uh, in her in her Silver Jubilee year, which was 1977. And I asked him recently, you know, when I was writing the books, how many times he'd met her. And he said he thought it was about six, but when we counted, it was a dozen times. And she's hosted him and he's hosted her. 
Um, and he then went on to work in the NHS. He, he ran a hospital and um, he had dealings with her with that as well. So it was great. And I mean, so in some of those occasions, my mother met her too. So my parents have seen her behind the scenes and that has really helped when I'm kind of setting some of the more fun scenes, you know, when she's out of the public eye and she's just kind of one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And it's really useful to know what she's like. And, and she's, she's charming, she's witty, she's really good mimic. Um, she's got a great sense of humor. Um, she's really on it, you know, you don't want to make a mistake really <laughs> in her company. So you, nobody would ever totally relax, but it's not, it's not that she, she wants you to relax. She really does. Uh, Cause it's easier for her if you do, but people just don't. So she's used to that. Um, so it was really handy having my parents um, descriptions of her. And the thing my mother said about that Britannia day was that she sparkles. And some people think with the book that I'm just kind of making this up but she kind of does. She's got that sort of Marilyn Monroe skin um, and she wears a lot of face powder and she wears diamonds and pearls and you know, with all of that going on, she does quite sparkle. My mother was really taken with that because she's really small, but you know, even, even without being the queen, she does stand out apparently. Now I also heard you have an interest in the queen's costumes or dressing. <laughs> That's how I got into it because when I was a little girl, um, one of my uncles was a merchant sailor and he traveled around the world and he brought me back a costume doll, a really, really beautiful costume doll from wherever he went. So I had a really high quality costume doll collection by the age of eight. Um, and I was really into, when I say fashion, I don't mean high fashion, I really mean kind of like historical fashion. Um, I was very, very curious about clothes and, and curious about, how how people have dressed over the years. So anyway, I was given this book called The Queen's Clothes, which I still have from 1977. And it was based on the, the designer Norman Hartnell who dressed the queen in the 1950s and when well, she was newly queen. And what fascinated me was just the little details, like um, her skirts normally weighted with like curtain weights so that oh, they wouldn't fly up. And I don't know why the younger royals haven't learned this trick, but she's been doing it for a long time. Um, and she can't, she has to wear sort of colors that, that really stand out in a crowd so people can see her easily, but she mm. must be garish. And she must wear hats that show her face and don't hide it. Um, and it's complicated being her. You know, she must wear shoes that aren't too high so that her feet don't get too uncomfortable, but not, not too low because she's really short to start with. Um, and, and so that's why I got interested in her. And that kind of carried through to the books, this idea that she's hugely privileged. You know, she does get to wear a lot of designer stuff, but she's really circumscribed by what it can be like. Um, mm. And that's how she is in my books too. You know, she's got access to anyone she wants to, to yeah. solve crime and ask questions, but she can't be seen to be interfering with the police investigation. So it's kind of like two steps forward, one step back. Um, interesting that you came out of a young adult literature background and you jumped into a mystery. Did you find it hard to plot a mystery? Do you start with the ending or the beginning or? I, yeah, I mean, it's not the first one I've written because in my 10 years of trying to get published, um, I wrote four mystery stories. That was what I did. Adult mysteries. People liked them, but they didn't publish them. I got a million rejection letters. Um, so I'd done it before, but I hadn't got published with them before. So I knew I wasn't doing it very well. Um, and you know what? Um, even though I had by then published um, 10 books for, as you say, for young adults, and I was teaching writing, I was still thinking this, this is a genre that I'm not fully comfortable with yet. So I just downloaded from the internet a kind of, you know, 101 of how, how, to, how to plot a mystery novel. And I was just incredibly lucky that it really resonated with me. So, you know, at this point, the detective's thinking this, and then at this point, the subplot comes in and I kind of just went through it and it was really helpful. <laughs> so um, I, had, I had that sort of one in one bit. And then I had what the queen was really doing uh, in 2016 and another bit. And then I had how I was molding uh, my own story. And actually the story was dictated by the setting. So something that yeah. happened at Windsor Castle and by the title, because the Windsor Knot came to me as title pretty much straight away. <laughs> um, 
And I remember saying to my husband, what can it be? Um, Because I had a stabbing to start with and it just wasn't working. And, And my husband said, it's kind of got to be a hanging and I thought, no, it can't be. That sounds dreadful. And then I thought, if you're going to write crime fiction, you've got to get used to the fact that people die. Um, so, um, so yes, a guy is found um, hanging in a wardrobe in Windsor Castle. And yeah. that's the title. Um, do you have a favorite story of the royals? I have many. Um, there's one that got discussed a lot on Twitter recently after Prince Philip died. Um, and I was one of the people sort of being involved in that um, because I didn't know the full story. There's a very famous photograph of the Queen and Prince Philip when they were in their 80s. He might all have already have been in his 90s. And he's dressed as the Colonel of the Regiment of the Grenadier Guards. So scarlet tunic and huge bare skin and he's Ooh. tall anyway so you know enormous and there's the queen very short um and then um, and she's dressed up and they're at Windsor Castle and she's bent over with laughter and it looks like he's just said something to make her laugh and she's howling with laughter and he's grinning and it's the most adorable picture of the two of them and this is the queen that kind of I want to write about really because she's often pictured looking grumpy And she's just unfortunate that she's got resting grumpy face. It's just one of those things. Um, But her natural instinct is to smile, I think. So I love that picture. Anyway, it turns out that what had happened was um, a swarm of bees had got out from the Buckingham, the Windsor Castle hives, and they'd swarmed under a chair. And they weren't stinging anybody. Nobody was getting hurt in this. And the beekeeper was on his way to, to deal with the swarm. And the queen finds it really funny when things go wrong, which they kind of do a lot. Um, and and she, you know, she lets people get on with sorting it out. Um, and I, I just, I love that moment captured between the two of them when he catches her eye and she can't help laughing. That's a great story. Um, how do you feel about incorporating the young royals into your uh, future series? Ah, uh, cautious, I think, is, is, is the word for it. Um, I, I mean, I, I, one again, a reason for choosing 2016 is I, I want to choose moments that are over, where there's some sense of closure. We know what's happened. Everybody's moved on. I'm not, I'm not commenting like a, a royal correspondent would be commenting because I, mm-hmm. I think that can get so intrusive. And I was reading today actually that the Crown is going to be talking about the Diana years next, of course, and um, or, or her death. And, and they're going to be sort of portraying how the young princes dealt with that. And I think that's, would I do that on TV? I, I don't, I'm not sure I would, could bring myself to. So um, my series will end in 2017. So just as Harry and Meghan are kind mm-hmm. of missing together. Um, and, and I won't, I won't really kind of delve into anybody's private lives I think um, I'll have them mm-hmm. in the background, but um, but again, what I'm interested in really is is how they they cope with living their real lives with with the sort of the press intrusion. So I will be talking about that very much so, and particularly in the book I'm writing at the moment, it's a big theme. But um, but I'm not going to get I'm not going to get too intrusive um, mm-hmm. mystery stories. So yeah, I'm much yeah. more in, much more interested in. Um, in killing a fictional character and then working out who did it. <laughs> Have you ever thought to use the Chelsea Flower Show as a background? That's such a lovely idea. Um, all the royals love it. I go because, you know, it's kind of walking distance from my house. Um, my mother is a huge fan of it. Um, so I'd love to incorporate it somehow, but um, I can't do it at the moment because it doesn't appear in book two in all the queen's Mm -hmm. men and just because there's too much stuff already um and then and then the queen's out of london for the next two books because she's in in norfolk and then she's in scotland so i might i could save it for um for book five but you know if enough people say please write about the chelsea flower show i will happily happily do that in fact, one of my university friends is a is a gold medal winning designer from the Chelsea Flash. Oh, so wow. if, if I need research, she can help me out. Do you think you'll go back into the young adult literature and bring mysteries to that level? Uh, no, I don't. In 
terms of young adult mysteries, I mean, perhaps they're just slightly younger than that, but the Robin, Robin Stevens um, series, Murder, Murder Most Unladylike, is absolutely fantastic. Have you got them in, in uh, the library? Do you know? I don't know, and I don't know if Barrett's Books has it, but we'll certainly take the recommendation. Oh, I think they're brilliant. They're, they're set in the 1930s and uh, they are about um, Hazel Wong, who is the narrator, and she's like the Watson character, and Daisy Wells, who is the Sherlock character. And, and it follows them through school. So actually they're, they're about, about 11, I suppose, when it starts, but they, they go into their teenage years as the series progresses. They're massive bestsellers here, as they rightly should be. And it's really interesting, they're set in the 30s, but they have a real contemporary take on all sorts of issues, you know, like unconscious racism of the English upper classes, for example, um, uh, and, and they're great little mysteries as well. And so I think Robin has, has done that. I mean, I, I did think about doing it, but Robin got there way before I did and she's done it so well. Um, so, so no, I, I, I've done one non-fiction book for young adults, uh, which is called, Women's art, I think, in America. It's with Abrams books and from the Tate. It, sorry? From the Tate? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's about um just over 30 women artists who've all got artworks in the Tate's collection. And I worked with them. They're, they're very, very aware that they they they're very underrepresented with women artists and they're doing everything they can to fix that. And this book was part of that. And it was a glorious thing to research. And because it was with the Tate, all the living artists were asked if they would like to do interviews for it. And so many did. Um, it's quite a thing, actually, you know, when you're, you're writing a little biography of Tracy Emin, for example, and you know she's going to read it and has to approve it mm -hmm. and you alongside it. Um, it was wonderful to do that. I thoroughly enjoyed doing that. So if I get the chance to do some more of that, I will do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned you took a field trip with your son. Do you see more field trips for future titles coming or have you already seen everything? Um, I haven't. And I booked a flight to Aberdeen today, as it happens. Oh, nice. Um, because I realized I need to visit places twice. I need to at least I need to visit them when the Queen is there so that I can get a sense of the scenery, the particularly the wildlife, you know, what trees are in bloom. Um, what uh you know kind of what the weather's doing and stuff Ooh. um but i can't see the buildings when she's there because she's there so i then have to go back when she's not there and have a look around the building so i've already done that with sandringham which is lovely in the winter because she's there at christmas and norfolk in at christmas is is wild and kind of brutal and beautiful and lovely um so yeah i need to do scotland for the summer uh, and that's going to be more of a thriller, the fourth book. Where I'm really looking forward to writing that. Oh, fun. Um, and yeah, and then I've been to Buckingham Palace a few times. I mean, thank goodness I, I went before the pandemic hit. I thought I had plenty of time, but uh, I love my research. So I went anyway. And then, you know, of course, it turned out for a year I couldn't have gone. So, yeah, I'm glad I did that. So, yeah, I do, do as, as much as I can. Britannia is now up in, in Edinburgh. So I will go and visit that. Um, and are you allowed to be on board, Britannia? Yeah, no? it's a museum now, really. Oh, so, yeah. Oh. How lovely. Um, just as an author, how long did it actually take you to write The Windsor Knot? Well, um, as is always the way, I, I do this writing podcast, and I was talking to somebody else about this yesterday, and, and it's his, his is the same as mine, really. It took about five or six months to write the first draft, I think. And a month of that was the denouement because the denouements for me are really complicated because, because the queen can't be seen to solve crimes. I sort of realized this as I was writing the first book and thought, oh yeah, that's true. Otherwise we would know. Um, she has to set it up so that somebody tells her how it was done. So she has to set somebody unknowing up to solve all the clues in the right order and then tell her. Um, and so I had to kind of make that happen and that that took a month. So it's about five or six months. And then obviously I did a, did a lot of editing on it. But um, but it really it took 18 months before that between the idea and starting to have the confidence to do it and to think up Rosie's character, which is really important and to find the voice. So it's a kind of it was, it was more than a two year thing in the end. Yeah. To get, it, get it ready. So will Rosie carry on? Yeah, Rosie's in the first four books. 
And oh, I'm glad that it, it's worked out that way because I'm hugely fond of her. <laughs> so I I like to see her kind of growing in confidence from book to book. Um, but she'll she'll have she'll have the biggest journey by far in the last book, in the fourth one. Uh, yeah, a massive a massive journey to go on. So yeah, really excited about that. So do you think you'll incorporate the pandemic in any of them? No, uh, it's all history for me. Oh, right, that's right. Prince so, Philip will be alive for all of them, which I'm kind of glad about. And um, yeah, no pandemic. But it was interesting. I was writing book two uh, during this one. And uh, as we all know, that was a strange, strange time. Um, and I was thinking, how lovely, you know, I can go back to 2016. It was all fine. Nothing was going on. And then I, I kind of Googled what happened in the second half of 2016 when book two is set. And it's like, oh, OK, there was the Brexit referendum. And then, oh, OK, there was the US election and there was quite a lot of stuff going on then. Um, so, yes, it really set the tone of that book in a way that I wasn't quite expecting. Um, now, you mentioned that the Queen's schedule is published and, of course, it was useful for your writing. Is it to generate crowds or is it just for the public to oh, know God, what no. you're doing? <laughs> No, no, really not. Um, I, I, I finally just found out actually why it happens at all. Um, and that is because the press was often misreporting what the royals were doing oh. I mean, decades oh. ago. And so the king at the time got really fed up. I think it might have been King George V, got really fed up. And he, <laughs> uh, he asked there to be one reporter whose job it was, was to correctly report what they were doing. Interesting. Uh, absolutely not on the gossip level, just on a, you know, they're opening a hospital or doing a medal ceremony or greeting some ambassador or something. That's, that's usually what they are doing and that's what gets reported. Um, and it's printed in the Times newspaper every day and always, you know, all my life that's been true. Um, but as I said, I was feeling quite lazy when I, <laughs> when I started writing. I was thinking, I'm not going to consult every Times newspaper. But yes, it's online now. It's called the Court Circular and it's online and it's got a lovely little search function. So, you know, I can say, what was she doing between this date and that date? And it's only the official stuff, but, you know, it will tell me exactly what she's doing, which means that I can make sure my books exactly fit around what she was really doing. So, um, yeah, I, I would thought, you know, I'll give myself some artistic license, but in the yeah. end I didn't need to. It was really fun fitting it around her real life. Yeah, before we started, we were speaking about the Queen's corkies and the comfort level they give to her in this book when she's a little upset. Would you share that with the audience? Yes, I'm so glad you picked up on that. Um, yeah, there are moments in the book where the Queen realizes something ghastly that, that's happened. And, and she naturally turns to the corgis for comfort. Um, so you often find her nudging her ankle against the nearest dog. Um, and at the time she had two corgis and two doggies. Um, a doggy is a dachshund corgi cross. And apparently oh. the queen's corgi got friendly with Princess Margaret's dachshund and that's how doggies were created. And they really liked the results. So they, they bred them after that. Um, so she had four dogs at the time. And yes, I was telling you the story that, that I heard on a, a lovely Radio 4 programme called Desert Island Discs, where people share their life story and, and their favourite music. And this was um, a, a surgeon called David Knott, who's very well known. He used to go out to Syria when it was still possible and train surgeons under fire to operate. And he saw some pretty terrible things and uh, and then he would come back and he would he would do his job in London. Anyway, um, he was invited to lunch with the Queen. So it wasn't a dine and sleep, I don't think. I think it was lunch. And and she asked him what he'd been up to. And normally he could talk about it, but he just found, you know, he was kind of overwhelmed with the moment. Mm -hmm. And he's a very emotional person and the emotion caught up with him and he couldn't talk. And the Queen. Um, asked one of the footmen to bring the corgis in and they just spent the rest of the lunch petting the corgis and <laughs> and I'm so interested you know people say oh it's protocol and you know you must always wear a hat and you must wear gloves and you can't touch the queen's back and all that kind of thing and the queen is is really quite more relaxed about protocol than people might think um so anyway they 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 um they petted the corgis and he said nobody had shown that same level of consideration really and understanding of what he was going through and it really stuck with him so I was glad to get a sort of an element of that yeah that was lovely um 
I'm sure you've seen The Crown. What's your impression of it? Well, I haven't seen all of it. Um, I saw the first two series of it and I loved them. Uh, it's, you know, I'm interested in the topic. It was set in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, that's my parents' generation. I didn't know so much about it. Um, I loved Claire Foy as the queen. Um, I do a costume. So, you know, I was gonna be interested in that side of it. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting stuff. And then, and then it got closer and closer to what I do know. And um, then I just found I was disagreeing with it too much and I didn't like the second cast as much. And yeah, I just, it didn't work for me as, as much. So uh, I kind of, I've paused it. I'm sure I'll go back to it, but yeah. I've paused it. Um, so I've seen, yeah, I've seen, seen sort of half of what's available so far. Well, let me, um, I think those are all such interesting insights into the queen and into your book. I'm going to open it up for questions and I have a few here already, so I'll just read them to you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, some people, some people, well, someone said, so sorry about the passing of Prince Philip. Is his character in the book. How is the tone in England now giving his passing? Um, well, it's been really interesting. Uh, his people were very sad when he died but not unduly surprised he was about to turn 100 um it was a pandemic so you know a, over a hundred thousand people have died in the pandemic um and and so there was there was a great sense of sadness but there was also a sense of let's not just focus on one person because we've been dealing with a lot of grief all over the place yeah. um and the BBC made a mistake and and kind of overdid the initial reporting, I think. And there was a there was a bit of a, um, a kind of reaction to that. But then there was his funeral and it was really interesting. Um, my father and I were talking about it. We were very moved by it. It was it was not how it was originally planned to be, because, again, because, you know, social distancing and all of that. I still had 700 soldiers, I think, there. But I mean, managing all of that with COVID rules was extraordinary. But it was it was much much simpler than it would have originally been, and there was the mm. queen sitting entirely by herself, aged mm -hmm. five, um, and and it was very moving and very simple and very beautiful, and um, and I think we all felt that it was very suitable for him actually, and he wasn't a big pomp and circumstance man at all. Uh, it would have been some he would have preferred I think what he ultimately got than the original thing that had been. Uh, had been planned so yeah it was it was very moving to watch that and it did injustice I think. Um, there's another question what was your mom's impression of the Queen when she met her which I think you touched on already but yeah um, she thought, yeah she thought she was she was funny and um, and very entertaining and very well informed um, and they did, yeah, they had, they had a really good evening. Um, you can imagine the glamour of, you know, mm -hmm. being on the Royal Yacht, it must've been amazing. Yeah, the, uh, an ad additional question is, and I think you've kind of touched on this also, is the queen as shy as she is described? Hmm, I <laughs> would not say shy, no. I don't think you can be when you've met pretty much everybody in the 20th yes. century, um, but she is, reserved she said when she was little that she, you know when she grew up she wanted to be uh, a lady in the country living with horses and dogs and that's what she would like to be and that's what she is sometimes and I think she's very very happy when she's a lady in the country living with horses and dogs um she's very competitive um she's a very very good dog breeder and horse breeder um and she's done that to a kind of world standard um I think, you know, all, all the other stuff she has to do, I think she's so good at it because it doesn't come naturally to her, you know, she's, um, yeah. she does it out of duty. And I think that means she does it in a kind of reserved way, which some people find um, off-putting, but uh, it's worked very well for her all these years. Sure. Uh, here's another question. What is the market like in England for stories about the royals? Ah. Uh, well, what kind of stories do you mean? <laughs> um, well, yeah, probably, probably not the newspapers. Yeah, the, I the, the the bad guys in my books are often the British press. 
Um, yeah. I, I personally think the British press have a really unhealthy relationship with the royals. Really, really unhealthy. They use them to sell. This isn't all of them by any means, but it, it's particularly some of them use the royal family to sell papers and sell magazines and any little snippet that they can get, they put on there. And, and the royals have just kind of learned over the years not to answer back, not to fight back. So not obviously anyway, um, which I'm not sure is healthy either. Um, I, I don't think they can win. You know, if they were to answer back, then they'd get an even bigger backlash. And if they mm -hmm. don't, then ugh, it's, yeah. it's, you can't win. Um, so yeah, there's an, there's an absolute fascination. There's something I, I mean, again, <laughs> I find so unhealthy is um, that uh, Kate and Meghan both had huge uh, support bases. And in that in itself, I think it's lovely. And because I'm a fashion follower, you know, I, I would instantly, you know, I would, I would be, be on, on the Kate fashion blogs and on the Meghan fashion blogs and see what I could learn. But they do tend to snipe at each other. I don't think they need to, and I don't think it's healthy, but there's a lot of that going on as well. So yeah, it all, it's all kind of, it all swirls yeah. around in, in a way that I, I find um, a bit over the top, really. Yeah. So I prefer just fictionalizing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone did vote, yeah, please do use the Chelsea Flower Show for a setting. Okay. Exclamation point. Uh, here's another one. What do you do when you're not writing? What do you do to relax? <laughs> um, well, I'm increasingly gardening. I have a very small inner London garden. Um, so a couple of flower beds uh, and, a, and a patch of grass with a table tennis table on it. Um, but I love that. And when the, when the weather's nice, um, my, my shed, my writing shed is at the far end of it. And I sometimes it can take me an hour to walk the length of kind of two table tennis <laughs> tables because, you know, things need deadheading or weeding or whatever it is watering um so i do that and i love art again there's a lot of art in in book two um so i mean i mean i was do it for a year but you know I'm, I'm in galleries whenever i can be um so that's another thing and lots of walking stay healthy um yeah so yeah those those you know classic kind of things i, I guess um i guess we didn't ask you how is london doing right now well, it's all about to change. Um, on Monday, we'll be allowed to see each other indoors and we'll be allowed to drink indoors in pubs, which, you know, for us is a big thing. And we'll be able to, um, some theatres will be opening finally, our galleries will be open again. Um, oh, yeah, it's a really big deal on Monday and lots of people have had two vaccines. I'm one of them, very luckily. Um, Great. So it will be good. It's been gradually, gradually warming up. You know, we had we had terrible, terrible time of it before Christmas, one of the worst in the world. Uh -huh. uh, and and then the government really kind of locked down hard. But it's been, yeah, I mean, L London's coming out of it okay. I mean, I think if you, you know, if you live in a tiny flat and you don't have a garden and you haven't been able to get out and you can't do your yeah. job, then hideous. Um, if you're lucky to have access to outdoor space and you can work, then then it's been okay. And now it's going to get better. And we just oh. had our first kind of live music event with the Brits. Oh. Um, so it's all starting at normal. It's, it's, it's not starting to go back to normal, but it's starting to go back to something that we recognize as life. Oh, that's good. That's good. There is another question about if you have any book recommendations and what are you currently reading? Okay. I am currently reading Detransition Baby by Tori oh. Peters, uh, which I'm loving. I'm halfway through. Um, I, I've had a couple of trans writing students, and so I've been very interested in their take on the world for a long time. And I'm very sad that they haven't been published yet. Um, so it's great to see uh, the trans world being described. So yeah, I'm fascinated by that. Um, and books to recommend. One of my favorite authors that, that I've been reading recently is Kate Atkinson. So oh, yeah. I love, if people want to get to, to understand how the UK <laughs> works in a, all its glory and all its problems, I think she captures that really, really well. And her stories are so intricately plotted and her writing is beautiful. So yeah. Good show. Well, I think we are at the end of our questions and you've been lovely to spend the time with us. And now I know it's quarter to 10, your time. So uh, quarter, quarter to nine, it's not so bad. Oh, oh, good, good, good. 
And um, I want to thank all our audience for participating and great questions. And remember everyone that Barrett Bookstore has these books. It's a great series. Start it now. You will not be disappointed and you'll just wait for the next one to come as we all do. I can't wait to see the cover, what they do with the next group. Yeah, no, I can't wait either. I'm very, very curious to see. Yeah. So I want to thank you. And I think we'll be signing off. But if anyone has any questions, you can always email them to us and we'll try to get them to um, SJ for a little response. Great. All right. You, All right. So good night, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.